The top business stories live from the Sky News City studio. The chief executive of Thames Water says he expects bills to rise sharply as shareholders refuse to inject half a billion pounds into the debt-ridden company. The plans that we have put forward require an investment of around £20 billion in that 2025 to 2030 period, and that would result in a bill rise of around 40%. I'll be joined by the CEO of the global infrastructure investor BBGI as demand for its services increases. And we speak to the UK head of Cadbury's owner Mondelez about Easter eggs, shrinkflation and the cost of cocoa. Good afternoon, this is Business Live with me, Ian King. The chief executive of Thames Water, Britain's biggest water company, has refused to rule out major increases in customer bills of up to 40% as the business tries to secure its future. Thames, which supplies 15 million households across London and the southeast of England, maintains its business as usual, despite struggling to find extra cash after shareholders pulled the plug on a half a billion pound funding deal. But it's laden with debts of nearly 18 billion pounds. As speaking to me earlier, Chris Weston, the chief executive, said bills were likely to rise. The plans that we have put forward, which are very much um, in accordance with what customers are asking us to do, require an investment of around £20 billion in that 2025 to 2030 period. And that would result in a bill rise of around 40%. And we recognise that at this current moment in time, that could be very, very difficult for people. So at the same time, we are looking at what we can do to protect those that are most vulnerable and can't uh, afford that type of increase. And so we have uh, a tariff that supports those people. No one is blaming you personally. You only joined the business in January. But nonetheless, there have been more than £7 billion worth of dividends extracted from this business over the last couple of decades. Surely more of that money could have been put towards future-proving the business. And I can understand why there would be that sentiment out there. But I think we also have to recognise the important role that equity providers, shareholders, provide, um, shareholders play in providing capital to invest in this network. And they, they have to earn a reasonable return at the same time. And I'm, I'm not commenting on the level of dividends that have been paid in the past, um, but they, they play such an important role. They do need some reward and recognition for what they're doing. Well, Natalie Thomas is a writer on Lex Investment column of the Financial Times and joins me now. Natalie, good afternoon to you. Um, how afternoon. do you see this on pass between off what and Thames's shareholders being broken? Well, the key date will really be mid-June uh, because at that point, off what the water regulator will, pub will give markets an idea of how much it will be willing to allow consumer energy, uh, consumer water bills to rise from 2025 and also the um, returns that it will allow investors to make uh, from 2025. Now, that will be crucial because the board of Thames Water, the regulated company, really needs to get new investors on side. Its current shareholders have, have said that they're not going to inject any new equity. And, and although there's always an element of brinkmanship in these sorts of tussles between the regulator and, and investors, I think on this occasion, they really do mean it. Do you have any sympathy with the shareholders here? I mean, uh, Chris Weston pointing out they haven't received a dividend since 2017. Well, the, the, the current shareholders, that, that's true. I think there's going to be a lot of soul-searching after, after this period about the, the way that water companies and, and other regulated utilities have been uh, handled since, since privatisation under previous shareholders the Thames Water, the entire group, it has a very complex structure, increased its debts and dividends have been paid out. And I, I think there will be a period of soul searching about how they, um, how regulators and the government actually allowed that to happen. With the current shareholders, they do have duties towards uh, towards their, their pension fund men members. So I do have an element of sympathy that they cannot put in more money into a company when they don't think they're going to get satisfactory returns. Now, there's a debt repayment due next month from Kemble Water, which is the ultimate parent of Thames Water. If they default on that, Chris Weston was saying to me this morning that wouldn't necessarily trigger the special administration regime. 
No, that's right. It won't automatically trigger the special administration regime, but it doesn't remove the urgency with which Thames Water will need to find uh, new uh, investors, new capital. It's got about £2.4 billion of liquidity, which would tide it over until May next year, but it will need to find at some point uh, new investors and and or, or new capital, whether that's from existing shareholders, or, although I think that's very unlikely. Very briefly, if you would, please, Natalie, what are the odds, do you think, of this company avoiding nationalisation? I think it'll avoid special administration in the short term. I don't think it's an immediate threat, but it remains a po possibility within, I'd say, the next year. OK, Natalie, got to leave it there, I'm afraid. Good to see you this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Now, cocoa prices have more than doubled this year following poor harvests in Ivory Coast and Ghana, the world's two biggest producers, all of which is problematic for chocolate producers like Mondelez, the parent company of Cadbury, which this year celebrates its 200th anniversary. I've been speaking with Louise Stigand, the UK managing director of Mondelez, at what is obviously a busy time of the year for her. Easter's a really, really important uh, moment in the calendar for us, as are both the seasons of Christmas and uh, Easter, because, again, it's those moments where our consumers come together. They really enjoy spending time with families and friends, celebrating the sort of seasonal moments. And, and for us, you know, today, we're nearly there, but actually a lot of sales happen in those last couple of weeks, so it still feels like, you know, until we get to Easter Sunday, then uh, it's the, the game's not quite over, but um, it feels like it's been a good season. Really? OK, I mean, that's very interesting, uh, given that there's been a lot of commentary about shrinkflation of late and you've been among those accused of this. What, what would you say to that? No, you know, I think um, we really understand that, you know, the economic pressure on our consumers is, is significant. And so raising prices for us is an absolute last resort, whether that be raising prices or changing the sizes of our product is the last resort that we, we take. But, you know, as I think is really publicly uh, out there. We're continuing to experience really significant uh, higher input costs, particularly on things like cocoa um, and sugar. You know, cocoa is a, a record high um, at the moment. Uh, and so as we, we think about that, we look at, you know, what, what we possibly can absorb and we've spent some time um, absorbing those costs and really seeing our margin be eroded uh, by that. But as a result of it, we carefully then consider, you know, what actions that we need to take, conscious, as I say, that it's our last resort. But we uh, will consider list price increases just simply because of the level of uh, input costs that we are uh, trying to address here. So, you know, the one thing that I and, and Cadbury hold really firmly on is we need to make sure that we maintain that taste that our consumers love and the quality they expect for us. And that's even more important. You know, those moments that you're celebrating with your families and friends, giving gifts and sharing, it's really important to, to do that. You mentioned cocoa prices. So I think they've more or less doubled over the space of two months. To, to what extent do you... Are you able to mitigate that by hedging and by buying on the on the futures markets? You know, I think there's there's some work that we can do and have done, but um, you know, with the levels of price increases, the cost increases that we're seeing come through on cocoa, then you know that becomes much less. Um, available to us in terms of uh, protecting the future. And that's why I say, you know, we've seen these costs sustainably increase for, for some significant time, getting to the highs that you describe. And in doing so, we have to think about how do we um, very carefully and very considered look at increasing our list prices as a consequence of that. So is it likely then that these uh, higher cocoa prices are going to feed through to higher prices in the stores before too long? I think the significant scale of them, you know, would suggest that we are likely to, to need to see prices increase in stores, yes. You know, or our list prices will increase to our customers, probably more rightly. It's very interesting, though, for anyone that goes into the supermarkets, it feels quite a promotional market right now. How much control do you have over, over the supermarkets discounting, for example, a, a bar of dairy milk? Look, you know, I think it's, as we all know, it's uh, retailers' prerogative to choose the prices that they want to sell at. But I think, you know, what where we've been working very closely and collaborating with our customers is making sure that we can still offer really good value and that we're bringing to life some of those important uh, moments, whether that be Easter or for us, you may well have seen uh, in stores what we're doing for our Cadbury 200th anniversary. Um, and I go, I've got a couple of bars here to 
little shameless plug, but, you know, looking at our bars through the decades, because we know that that's, uh, you know, consumers really remember Cadbury in their childhood. So we all, when we look at these bars and can see the different packs, go, well, actually, I remember that one from the 1970s or the 2000s, you know, as we've evolved and changed. So we're doing a lot of work collaborating with our retailers to make sure that we bring, you know, the generous spirit of Cadbury to life in store as we go through uh, the rest of 2024. How has Capri consumed the products consumed 200 years ago? Was it more of a luxury good and less ubiquitous than it is today? So, um, you know, if you think about the starting point of Cadbury, it was in a, a small shop in the middle of Birmingham, um, and they started really their business as a grocery store, then moving into cocoa, and that was really the first sort of real touch into that sort of chocolate or chocolate type um, product, and then moving latterly into Cadbury Dairy Milk um, as a bar product. But I think you're right, you know, some of the the, the luxury element of it was also around the packaging. So um, if you look at some of our packaging from the 1800s, you know, it would be beautifully hand painted um, and in very, very ornate boxes because it was a real, real, real luxury at that time. Now, just under 15 years ago, of course, Cadbury was bought by Kraft. It was a very controversial deal at the time. And then subsequently it was spun out into Mondelez. How does the business differ from the one that Kraft bought all those years ago? And, you know, I've been with the business for 30 years. So, you know, I do really appreciate, you know, that moment um, of change. You know, there was uh, some stake stakeholders who had concerns. You know, I think what I can very firmly say sat here is actually a lot of the ethos of the Cadbury business in terms of how we treat our colleagues, how we work in our close communities um, and nurture that and how we invest in the business. It is very, not dissimilar to the Cadbury of, you know, 200 years and after almost. So, you know, a lot of the work that we've been doing um, as part of 200 years is really celebrating the role that Cadbury has played in the community and the lives of the public, but also really importantly with our colleagues. And, and I think that investment part is really important. And as part of uh, Mondelez business, we've invested just over 270 million in the Bourneville factory alone in the last 12 years. And I think that's an important indicator of how seriously we take Bourneville as the home of Cadbury. Um, and not just in manufacturing. We also have our global um, R&D site here at Bourneville. Uh, and so it's a really important location for any of the Mondelez chocolate products start their life here in the R&D centre. And that investment to create that is a, a really meaningful commitment uh, to, to Mondelez in the UK and the Cadbury brand in Bourneville. Now, a lot of fast-moving consumer goods businesses, uh, including Cadbury's, are uh, under, it seems, increasing pressure from food health regulators around the world. We've already had the introduction of a sugar tax or whatever. Where do you think we are now in terms of that debate? I think, um, you know, at Mondelez, we would say, you know, we know and can see that there is a, um, a serious scale impact of the public health challenge but obesity is really complex and i don't think you know there is a one solution there needs to be a whole system solution and approach so thinking about it from really scientific based and consumer led is how we would see the best way to progress um, to make a difference and i think therefore that sort of single minded focus on one particular nutrient or one particular product is not particularly helpful in in helping people move uh, to a better balanced diet and lifestyle. So, you know, what we do is we really focus in the places that we know we can make the most difference as Mondelez, and that is around portion control. And we, over the last number of years, have, have looked at um, products that typically would be bought um, by parents for children and made sure that their portion control is less than 100 calories. And then on our multi-packs, we've made sure they're less than 200 calories. And I think, you know, the, the net impact of that in a year is about 12 billion in calories taken out um, of the UK diet, which I think is, you know, a very significant change that, that we can make and support. And alongside that, then we look at reformulation and innovation um, and are just in the process of launching a Cadbury fruitier and nuttier um, bar, which is lower in fat, salt and, and sugar. Um, so I think there is, you know, for, for me, that's really about a whole systems approach. And then as Mondelez, us really doing the things that we can make a difference um, and impact most significantly. 
That was Louise Stigant from Mondelez. Now, demand for maintaining, repairing and constructing new infrastructure is growing almost everywhere, but many governments are increasingly constrained by debt. That, in theory, should benefit private sector investors like BBGI, whose portfolio includes the Avon and Somerset Police Headquarters, the A7 motorway near Hamburg and the Lewis and Clark Bridge across the Ohio River. Well, it today reported a pre-tax profit of £33.6 million for 2023, down from £122.5 million in 2022. Well, joining me now is Duncan Ball, he's Chief Executive of BBGI. Duncan, welcome to you. What was behind the drop in operating income? Well, I think our uh, drop in operating income has been impacted by the rise in discount rates across our portfolio. So it's, we've not been immune to rising interest rates, but our portfolio has performed very strongly. We have 56 assets around the world. They've all done well. Um, we've been able to uh, increase our dividend, which is fully covered. And uh, we're very proud of the work we do in our portfolio. So this isn't necessarily a cash uh, movement? No, we, we focus on uh, primarily our dividend and uh, our, our net asset value. Now, you made no new investments last year. Why was that? Well, we looked at a lot. Um, we're very active in the market and we're seeing a lot, but we've been very disciplined over the years in allocating capital. The last two assets we bought, we bought the A7 motorway in Germany. We bought uh, the John Hart Generating Station in British Columbia, Canada, which serves, um, produces clean energy for 80,000 homes. And both those assets were bought and we've effectively paid for those out of free cash flow. So we've been able to grow the por portfolio organically. What are the key characteristics you look for in a portfolio investment? I mean, obviously, presumably it's a stable and predictable income. Yeah, so we're in uh, seven countries and they're all credit worthy. So we're, we look at the inflation linkage. We look at the quality of the cash flows coming from, we're serving the public sector, so we're getting paid by strong credit worthy governments. Uh, but we do a lot of due diligence. We screen against ESG. Um, so we have a very, very vigorous process before we make any new investments. Mm, and, to, and to wit, what we've seen with uh, Thames Water this morning here, you presumably also look for a very stable regulatory environment. Uh, well, we're, we're fortunate. We don't have any regulatory assets. We have um, availability style assets. So it means uh, that we get paid if the asset's available. So for instance, we have schools and those schools may have been closed during COVID, but they were available for use. So we were still getting paid. Um, and it also means we're not subject to regulatory review. Uh, so we have contracted cash flows. The contracted cash flows mean uh, we can look out for the next 15 years and without making any further investments, we can continue to pay a covered dividend uh, that's progressive. So uh, lots, of, lots of predictability to the income from streams. Now, there are quite a few bridges in your portfolio. What are your reflections on what's happened this week in Baltimore? Uh, well, let me begin by saying it's very tragic what's happened in, in Baltimore. Uh, it was sad to see what happened. But I'll stress that it's a very different situation than what we have. Uh, the the uh, Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore was built in 1977, and it was built to very different standards. So you think of a modern automobile and airbags and all the safety mechanisms, it's very different than a car from the 70s. And the same thing can apply to our bridges. We have four uh, cable stay bridges that are uh, you know, major, major structures. Um, the one you may know here in the UK is the Mersey Gateway Bridge. And it, all those have been designed to modern standards, um, and most of them don't have um, heavy shipping traffic. And when there is, it's typically in a, in a dedicated canal beside the bridge. So it's a, it's a very different situation. But what it does highlight is that a lot of the infrastructure we use on a daily basis isn't up to uh, old, standard, yeah. so it needs, needs fixing. I mean, Joe Biden talked this week about essentially the US taxpayer standing behind any reconstruct should he be looking at a private sector solution? Uh, well, we, we have a bridge in the U.S. called East End Crossing, Ohio River Bridges, and it's been a great investment um, for us, and it's been great for the community, um, and um, that's been done with private sector money. So it's reduced travel times for people outside Louisville, and uh, it's really a showcase for public-private partnerships. So we're, we're optimistic that the U.S. government will do more uh, PPPs, and we, we think that we'll continue in other jurisdictions where we're active as well. Very good. Duncan, we have to leave it there. Come back and see us soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Still to come here on Business Live, we'll have a look at how the markets have finished this shortened trading week. Don't go away.
when you see the 12A or the 15 and you know kind of what age range it's meant to be suitable for, when you're booking a film online or indeed watching it online often now on Netflix, for example, you'll see those age ratings. And they're from the British Board of Film Classification. And they consult every five years with up to 12,000 people, quite a lot of people around the UK, and ask them what they're concerned about in terms of, you know, what they'd be watching, what their children would be watching. And it's interesting to see that they've recently done a new survey. It's interesting to see how attitudes have changed in, in reference to things like sex and drugs and bad language and, and discriminatory what about something language. like this? You can do no wrong, as far as I'm concerned, Sean Connery. Is there an issue with that from Russia with Love? There is. So, so they spoke to people and they show certain clips and apparently now people would be more comfortable with this being a 12A rather than a PG. In that case, it was mostly due to the violence. Um, so that indicates that people are perhaps becoming more offended by certain things. Um, you know, there's a, a high kill count, as you'd expect in that film. It's super califragilistic, expialidocious, even though the sound of it is something quite atrocious. If you say it loud enough, you'll always sound precocious. Super califragilistic, expialidocious. So is that just because people can't say it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it... In the issue with Mary Poppins, because that's coming out again for an anniversary, and um, I think the general idea is that there's one scene that people had a problem with, which was with the chimney sweeps, and there was worries about discriminatory language. Oh, OK. So, therefore, it's now... So, it's not his ridiculous Cockney accent? <laughs> it is not, no, <laughs> even though that's probably the most offensive <laughs> thing in the film. Um, but, yeah, I think that, you know, there, there are problematic moments in it, and it's, again, it's just about flagging it up and, and sort of recognising people's concerns. This is the game changer seat. Look, it even comes with binoculars. Fly Emirates, fly better. Thank you. Welcome back. Some other business news stories for you now. In the Office for National Statistics confirmed today the UK entered a recession during the second half of last year. It said UK GDP contracted by 0.1% in the third quarter of 2023 and by 0.3% during the final three months of the year. Both figures were unchanged from its previous estimates. However, it's thought likely the UK has already left recession, with the ONS recently reporting the economy grew by 0.2% in January and surveys suggesting expansion continued into February and March. JD Sports said today its sales in the UK and Ireland during the three months to the end of January fell by 3.2% on a like-for-like -like basis. That's the measure that strips out the impact of new store openings and refurbishments. JD Sports blamed tough comparisons with the previous year and heavy discounting by rivals. But shares of the company have risen by more than 11% today on reassurances that profits for the year will be in line with the company's previous guidance. 
And the telecoms equipment testing group Spirant Communications has agreed to a £1.16 billion takeover by the US rival Keysight Technologies. The deal first reported last night by Sky's Mark Lyman trumps a previous one from VRV Solutions, which was 15% lower. Former FTSE 100 member Spirant, which was previously called Bothorpe, employs 1,500 people, serving more than 1,100 customers in more than 50 countries worldwide. Uh, in Europe now, stocks have uh, finished the session largely to the upside. I think I can show you what's been going on in mainland Europe. Well, actually, uh, look at that. The MIB in Milan was more or less unchanged than the IBEX in Madrid. Lower uh, European stocks, however, however, however finished uh, up, the, uh, up for the uh, first quarter of the year. Here in London, the FTSE 100. I'll show you how that one's finished up. Up a quarter of 1% there. The FTSE also finishing the first quarter up. In terms of the leading gainers, JD Sports was the top performer. That is uh, finished up some 15.5% to the good. To the downside, a number of stocks have gone ex-dividend today. In other words, they're trading for the first time without the right to the latest payout. They include M&G, Smith & Nephew and Taylor Wimpy. Don't own if you own those stocks. That's just because they've gone XD today. Outside the FTSE, Spirant is leading mid-cap gainers on that increased takeover bid, while the online electrical goods retailer AO World has risen by 11%. On a trading update, the North Sea oil producer Enquest is up 3 three quarter percent for similar reasons. Over on Wall Street, stocks have crept higher at the open with the Russell 2000 small cap index at its highest level for a year, the S&P 500, meanwhile, is on course for its best first quarter since 2019. Talking points include Home Depot off uh, for 1% on use its buying the building materials supply, SRS distribution for £18.25 billion. Pounds. On the foreign exchange market, well, the dollar was uh, stronger during the session, but it's given back those gains more or less as uh, time has gone on, certainly against uh, sterling. Meanwhile, the oil price has edged up overnight following news of a lower than expected rise in inventories. 87.37 is Brent crude up 1.5%. That's it from me. Happy Easter. I'm off next week. See you on Monday week. Thanks for joining me. Cheerio.